This is Jesse Hensley. This is Josh Turner. And this is Chris Bow. Welcome to Turn Down for What. Welcome back to Turn Down for What. Uh, we have a fun, interesting episode for you today. Uh, kind of a unique uh, guest today that we uh, are very excited about. Um, but first, before we go any farther, if you are listening to this on any platform, uh, feel free to subscribe. If you are on YouTube, subscribe as well. Uh, we got a lot of fun content uh, today, but also coming up in the near uh, future. So anyways, uh, now it's time to introduce our guest for the day. Uh, we have Frenzy from Out of Spec Studio slash podcast. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Francie. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Hey, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me on to the Turn Down for What podcast. Happy to be yeah, here. Yeah. So just to start with, last we had the Super Bowl and we, we got a shout out in the Super Bowl from at Little the John. Show. I mean, Little John shouted us out in the halftime show. It was crazy. Turned down for <laughs> what? Did. I loved it. He did. Oh, the crowd now went I get wild. It. There you mm-hmm. go. See? That the song came. It. The song came on, and my wife just looked at me and kind of just eye rolled. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> here comes Jesse and Chris in our little group chat. We have texting, and Chris within like thirty minutes had a little uh, promo up on uh, social media saying we got the shout out. I mean, it's uh, it is what it is. But I mean, yeah. th- that's how we've chosen to brand ourselves. So here we are. Until we Love get it. big enough for a cease and desist, we're going to keep on uh, enjoying that. You know. I worked with our producer and he said if we only use the little tiny snippet that we're fine. So I think I think we're okay. But at some point, little John, if you have a problem with it, you can join the podcast and it'll be so that everybody be sued ever. Yeah. <laughs> fine. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I saw I saw your tweet about that, Chris. And uh, I was like, wait, what? But now <laughs> it's making the connection. Now there. we're now we're putting it together, right? Yes. Yeah. That was a, a good show. I liked it. Yeah, yeah, good times. Well, all right, guys. Who wants to start it off? I, I guess think we I should can. let. Well, I, yeah. I think we should let Francie introduce herself. Uh, tell us yes. a little bit about sure. herself, and then now, and then we the, can talk. Yeah. Is this the part where we highlight women in the industry? Uh, coming up, coming up. I want to. I definitely want to coming up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's what she said. W a t t. What so, she said. Oh, nice. That's what yep. she said. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Welcome Francie. to our first ever That's What She Said segment. Very oh, cool. Happy to be a part of the inaugural uh, launch. And uh, yeah, so I'm Francie. I work with Out of Spec, Out of Spec Studios specifically. My project is to run the podcast where I like to say we talk about everything EV, electric vehicle, and electric vehicle adjacent. So this goes every which way direction from owning and living with an EV to the charging infrastructure, to the regulation and policy around it, to battery technologies, renewable energies, the electric grid, everything that really connects because it all does connect. And I'm I'm definitely having fun with it. Uh, This is my first podcast ever. So I've, I've started with Out of Spec last year around September in 2023. And before then, I was working in electric vehicle charging, public charging infrastructure with EVgo. So I worked with EVgo for a couple of years, actually, uh, first on the business development team, building automaker partnerships specifically and maintaining them. And then I moved over to the account management team where I ran the projects and, uh, you know, grew the partnerships. So I really enjoyed it there, actually. And, you know, back before that, I... I actually studied science, natural science. I uh, love biology and evolution and ecology, and that's what makes the world make sense to me. And I always had a passion for how can I protect it? How can I learn about it so I can better leave the world a better place? That's always kind of been my mission, which kind of led me, you know, science is really cool. And I was really interested in research, but uh, the research I was seeing was being done. And then what comes next? You know, I loved reading about the research, but we learn about a problem and a possible solution. And then I wanted to be a part of the more actionable side of things, taking that research. And business is obviously a very great way to make a difference and it it can be a force for good. So that's why I moved in this direction. I did a lot of consulting under my own name on business development projects, ranging from everywhere from startups and helping them start up uh, from like carbon soil sequestration startups to 
other mission oriented startups and then bigger corporations doing like market research and how to keep wildlife from being electrocuted on power lines and stuff like that. So I have a bit of a diverse background, but when I look back at my path, I see why it led me here, but it definitely took a little bit uh, figuring it out. And now I love working with out of spec. I get to be really creative and it's like, I'm back in university. I am learning so much all of the time from experts, from all the research that we do. And I am an EV driver. It took me a minute because it's not always easy <laughs> to get an yeah. EV, you know, but I have a VinFast VF8 that I am living with. It is a, you know, a company car, but uh, she's, she's here with me. That's have a little settled, bit about me. Have you settled on the name? Is it, is it, I'm assuming it's she, so it's not Frank. Is it spring roll? Is it, what's the. Well, I don't, people call me Frank as well. So, you know, okay. uh, but that, so that's kind of where that came from. So like pho, you know, is food from Vietnam, which we on the team love. And it happened to be that in the VIN, it had pH zero. So we were like pho. So maybe pho rank was funny. Spring roll was cute. Cause she's green and she rolls. And yep. um, <laughs> so, you know, she, just like I'm Francie, Frank, hey, Francie, she can be multifaceted as, uh, faceted as well. But I don't know. I kind of, what do y'all think? Which which name do you like? I, I like the spring roll. Cute. Yeah, that's pretty yeah, cute. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty the, cute. I had a chihuahua named Tonka Dozer. So, I mean, you could go with both names. I'll call it Frank <laughs> Spring Roll. And then you could have the spring roll as the nickname. Or if it gets in trouble or is doing something shit, do just call it, you know, spring. That way. Hey, yeah. Spring. You know, you're so. spring. Spring. spring and I, I love that you did the ven fast because it's it's so you know it's so out there the the kind of big big brands you know and um ven fast i i ran into the ven fast guys out here in california when they first were testing it on the road and it was such a strange car to look at they were really protective of it and you just couldn't see a lot of it and then you know you had all the press and media kind of thing where they were paying people and then for you guys to do a long term on that i think is really cool and for you especially as a new ev owner because this is your first one right you've been in many but this is your first yeah this is the first one that i get to drive on the daily you know my parents have had teslas and my brother has a tesla but and my grandmother had a tesla <laughs> so yeah. but this is my first one yeah and and shout out to your dad. That's my favorite. As a dad, that's my favorite podcast episode. Is when you went with him to pick up his his uh, <laughs> Plaid uh, Model S. That was really cool. Uh, that so was I fun. loved. Yeah, that that's that was awesome to see. But to to have you experience Eventfast, I think, and and see that part of the market that not a lot of people hear about, especially from a woman's perspective. Like I loved how one of the things you called out early. Um, was how your dog had plenty of room in the back and didn't get motion sick. And these little things that are like we refer to all the time in the lightning as just the practical quality of life aspects of the vehicle that are sometimes lost in the zero to 60 or sometimes lost in the the technology and stuff. This is because, you know, we're on that weird cusp of early adopters and are we quite into early majority yet I, I think we thought we were there we talked about this last week with ford's announcement where we think you know got over their skis a little bit with that momentum of oh 250,000 reservations we we're going to get to early majority uh pause a little bit maybe we're not there yet and to get there it's the stuff that i think you're experiencing it's 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 not going to be the techie stuff it's going to be the everyday practical family you know, stuff like what you're driving, what my district manager drives, the, the what my mom would drive, what's going to get them into an EV. So when you talk about these things on the daily, it points out some of the cool things that even a new brand like VinFast is still delivering from a user experience, but then it also demonstrates what needs to be bridged if the, the every person is going to live with these things. Mm hmm. It's definitely a unique automaker for sure. Ven fast for like all the reasons you mentioned. And, you know, it's like been touted as like the worst reviewed EV and stuff. And I think it's due to the fact that there are such, you know, advanced, there's advanced technology in EVs like Tesla and Ford too, that are just like really great. And then VinFast hasn't hit it on that parts, but there's lots of things that work. Like 
when we were picking it up from the dealership, I mean, there's lots of things things that work. That's an understatement. It's it, it really runs. It's a fine car. Uh, there's some software bugs for sure, and some things that I'm still figuring out, like why it isn't connected to data right now. But it it drives well, and yeah, I I think that it is going to be really fun to see because there hasn't been long term ownership. Although there are people out there who are live have been living with a V8 for quite a while now, and um, VF8, and don't don't mind it and actually love it and are really excited to see someone in the media covered space to drive it for a while. So I'm glad to do it. It's a little bit of a mysterious car. So hoping to break down some of that mystery. We've discussed a lot of different models, but we've never actually brought up uh, VinFast specifically because it is kind of a a smaller uh, player in the space, but that's something that uh, obviously, you know, it's, a, a very viable vehicle option. And I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see kind of what, obviously you've given a little hint to it, but what you think in general about that uh, as a whole. Yeah. I, I mean, and they're opening up a manufacturing plant in uh, North Carolina where we got it. So, you know, their, their footprint is growing. And like I said, there were people at the dealership just buying it flat out. So it's, they're definitely going to be on the road. The only thing is that I want to see is, the things that I've seen from Tesla and Rivian, which is responding to the problems that exist in a timely manner with over the air software updates, you know, being really proactive or reactive, but forward thinking and improving on that. And I'm not so sure like with the base of what they have, like with the hardware that the software is, you know, running on how it will be able to be improved so that's something i'll i'll just have to see i like i said i took i picked it up from the dealership in north carolina immediately drove it 800 miles and comfortable ride like i i I, and great highway driving assistance and decent efficiency you know it's not a porsche Taycan. it does not charge like crazy and it charges slowly like you know on a road trip you're spending 30 to 40 minutes getting enough charge to get to the next spot but like we had charging all along the way and it was fine and you know i'm patient and that's the experiment and uh that was decent to me of course in a vacuum it's a it's a it's a good car that I think anyone could enjoy, but I'm going to see how buggy and annoying that becomes as I learn about it too. So I know there's a transition period for both me and spring roll getting to know each other. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think as lightning owners is someone that's a, I've got the standard range. Both of these fellows have the extended range. Um, but you know, the lightning isn't particularly known for a, for a high charge curve. It's got a good charge curve, stays nice and flat mm-hmm. for a good long time. Um, but it peaks you know, at 175. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that's and that's for yours. Mine doesn't even peak that high. Mine peaks a little bit lower than that. So it's mm. um, it, it is it is an interesting thing though. Uh, so uh, this is my first EV. Um, I've always loved EVs, but um, I am too big and fluffy a guy to get into a Model Three as great as a value as that is. Um, but you know, my sister had an X and an uh, and an S and. Uh, so I loved Tesla. I have like a, a whole, you know, I have the power wall. I have a whole cabinet full of Tesla swag because I love them. Um, but getting into the EV thing, you know, the the supercharging was almost overplayed is what I found because I'm charging at home, which is, I think, really the sweet spot. Um, obviously, for wide scale adoption, we got to figure this out at, at work and shopping centers and fast charging. And and even for that matter, uh, I think you guys touched on it with the whole Costco thing and unplugging, right? Like, is that... Um, is that the right place for uh, a high powered DC fast charger or, you know, uh, Jesse and, and Josh, I've done some, some work out here with a company called charge net stations. And they set up partnerships with uh, taco bells out here. They've just got two locations and they're starting to expand a bit more, but they only have 75 kilowatt chargers. And in their platform, as you're charging, you get a coupon on your phone that says go inside for a free taco or burrito and then you literally walk in while you're charging for that. And by the time you've ordered your food, you sat down, you've eaten it, you come out. And at a 75 kilowatt, it's an appropriate speed, um, more appropriate, right? Or, you know, your background with EVgo, they're famous for having the 50 kilowatt stations and the right tool for the right job, I always say. And and I mm-hmm. think that's that's a big part of it. So, well, yeah, that's, you know, maybe it's not going to be Porsche Taycan, but it is, again, for the every person, it's just doing a lot of their driving. It's it's an appropriate vehicle in a lot of ways, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, 
you can like the leapfrogging kind of road trip, you know, charging style that shows that of course we need more infrastructure and high powered DC fast chargers are great for road trips and along corridors, but there's so many different use cases. And there's a lot of research that's been done, like with the National Renewable Energy Lab in REL in Boulder, Colorado, and tons of other research labs that are like, if we're going to have tens of millions EVs on the road, what's really important is level two charging. And then of course, the really slow charging, of course, if you want to do that, but those are the pieces that are going to fit in. But I think, yeah, in the infancy, kind of like you're saying, we've put just chargers kind of where they would go and like at different speeds and figuring out actually this might not be the fit for this kind of situation. You can't really just uninstall that infrastructure. It's so expensive, but planning right. forward, how can we make smarter decisions? Well, and it also comes down to a cost variable as well. So let's mm -hmm. take back your Costco example. So when you have a Costco, you can buy power in order to run that station or that building for a much lower rate. That's why Costco in Florida, for example, I think there is some EVgo systems that are down there. Uh, you know, they're charging right now 24 cents per kWh final cost. If you go in and charge, that's extremely low when you compare it to even yeah. where we are in Tennessee. So mm -hmm. it, it's going to also be as the market changes, is it 50 that's going to be the best? Is it 70? What is the time period that people are going to be in there? Is it something mm -hmm. that you offer as a uh, a free service in order to get people to come to your structure at the time where you have a complete upending on how the economy is going for retail box stores to begin with, with home delivery systems. So you have mm -hmm. all those variables that are coming in at a time to upend a market that is also balancing itself on how many vehicles and how many raw materials can be produced in order to create these cars to begin with. So when you start talking about things like VinFast, you know, a lot of people don't know about VinFast, you know, and that's a great thing about it because they do offer a seven passenger uh, vehicle. I got to drive the uh, Kia EV9, EV9. Uh, this past yep. week and uh, nice. beautiful vehicle, uh, 280 mile range, I believe. And when you look at the EV or the EF9, which is the v uh, VinFast version of their SUV, also seven passenger, you know, you're looking at a little bit more expense up front, but a little bit more mileage as well. So it's like, wow, that's already here. It's not been waiting for a long time. So it, uh, made in North Carolina. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And, you know, you have the EV7, 8, 9, and you said you have a 6? 8. eight. She yeah, eight. I have the VF8. Eight. Okay. So you've got a 6 and a 7. I think the 6 is, or the 7, one of the two isn't out yet, but the other, mm -hmm. other ones are. So there's a full range of vehicles that they're going to be producing. And, mm -hmm. you know, and now you think, where do we charge them at? Is it like you're saying, do you go home on that route and then only use it around town? You know, uh, there was announcements this week about Ioni, which is a 30,000 charging system company that seven or eight automakers have joined together this past week to create that network. And you keep hearing about the networks coming. This one is supposed to go up against Tesla. So as a person in the industry like you are, what when you look at the future of the industry, where do you see it going? And what do you think is the biggest opportunities that are coming in the next year or two to kind of keep the industry going? That's a great question. Yeah, when I think about like what you were just talking about, the seven automakers coming together to build out this network, which, you know, they announced that they were going to get together like a year ago or so, but there's so much. I mean, if you think about the different entities, all they're global entities that are going to there and it is one entity. So they're like have their representatives, but Ion or, or whatever, I O N N A is a company distinct from any of the automakers, but they had to do, I'm sure, so much legal stuff to get aligned there and figure out, okay, if we're going to have a North American charging network, represent ourselves and create a company, how how is that going to happen? So we like I see it as a huge opportunity for them to hit it out of the park. Take all the lessons learned from all the failures in the public EV charging infrastructure and do not repeat them. So that is, to me, you know, get... High powered fast chargers for sure. I think that's a big part of their goal uh, along corridors, along the road trip stuff, kind of like what the EVgo GM Pilot Flying J is doing. But you know, some some of those sites are just four stalls. So, whereas Tesla, the same place will have like 
20, 20 yeah. stalls. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, right. and there's like four Teslas there. So definitely, I think keeping in mind that more ports is good and really the case study of where, wh what kind of speed is there. So, and there's great, better manufacturers today too, that it's, and with the Tesla network, it's, they have good hardware. Yes. But they also have really good maintenance. They, you know, problems happen just the same, but they respond very quickly. Whereas sometimes sites only get attention once you tweet about it or whatever it is and draw attention. So I know that that's hard, but building up the workforce, building up whatever your contractors you have and having those on the ground, I think is really important. So they, you know, they announced their CEO who is coming from elect well, a, a, a EV Connect, but then a background of Electrify America. Some people were like, oh my God, why would you? But I'm like, who yeah. knows? Maybe he had good ideas and they didn't listen to him. You know, maybe he has lessons learned that he, may, I mean, I, I certainly hope so. And I don't think these automakers are dumb. I think they're hopefully appointing someone who will be able to run this. So I see that as great potential. And with Electrify America, it's it's tough because their whole situation, how they you know, we're, you know, diesel gate, it, it right. seems like very clearly, a, a uh, you know, they, were, they were, yeah, dragged into it. They had to put it up, put them out, but then actual maintenance of them in the background. But I'm sure people are on the Electrify America team that are like, I want to make a network that actually works and be working towards something that doesn't have such a notorious, you know, right. reputation. A lot, of mm -hmm. their, a lot of their initial investment came in through uh, out of country products for cost um, that were less than ideal hardware um, and software, and they're improving. And I've used some of their newer stations that they've they've improved, and it's been mm -hmm. a general better experience. Uh, obviously, it's newer hardware, but when you're dealing with a bunch of you know, let's say fifty thousand dollar high powered units coming out of uh, China or Taiwan, you know that's something that you can't expect the same as. A lot of, I mean, the Nevi uh, program with all the releases that they're doing are mostly made in America, uh, but also they require 97% uptime. And so it's 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 put it in force where these um, providers are having to, one, produce, you know, good quality products, but two, make sure that if uh, there is any issues like you're saying with Tesla, that the network stays up, which reliability mm -hmm. of the charging infrastructure is, is something that's going to be crucial for encouraging adoption. Uh, because the amount of times I've gone to a charging site and it's either full or the ones that are available are broken or operating at minimal capacity, there's no confidence when it comes to road trips and in, in being comfortable. I get a 320 range, but in a truck in the winter, you know, it turned into being, you know, 220, um, which, you know, that's a, a pretty big cap. And then you have to sit there, rely on spaced out infrastructure and the new stuff which pilot did on their own uh was costing we talked about this but it, it's costing 60 cents a kilowatt uh well oh yeah then, then it costs more than gas to be driving your less efficient mm -hmm. in the cold because the my lightning doesn't have a heat pump uh because it was the original models um you know all of a sudden now it's costing me basically to get there and to nashville and back from where i'm at it would cost me basically 130 dollars where a gas pee power truck might get me there for a hundred. Um, so it's actually more expensive uh, because of the unreliability, but the ones that work are expensive. Uh, and it's just, it's kind of a catch 22 to making sure that we have affordable, reliable equipment across the, across the uh, corridors. Well, and now that we're actually in that sphere, we can look at the numbers. We can see how much profit we get, even with the incentives that we're getting from the federal government to do the build outs and everything. There's not a lot of money to be made. So, are you going to really invest hard or is that investment not worth it if you're only making X amount at these locations? So now that we've mm -hmm. been in that sphere, you know, we look, I'll, I'll look at it too, of how the car itself has came along. So you had the first vehicle came in, what, uh, I think it was uh, 1885, 1886 time. And then you didn't have the Model T until 1908. So you've got 22, 23 years, probably closer to 22 years before you had something that everybody could use. So if you go on that next example, the first company to create this was Electrify America for the majority of everybody. When I would go to DC recently, when I was working for a, a, a hyperscale data center there, I would stop only at Electrify America two times getting there. When we go to Nashville, we would stop at Electrify America. So they're the only ones. 
I don't think they're making a lot of profit off of this, meaning they don't have a lot of extra money to spend on replacing these units. And then you have these grants coming in. Do you want to replace it today or do you wait until these grants hit? So I think they were kind of in a bad PR storm that they really couldn't do anything until these grants came out. And I hate it for them because they were the first, but it also showed everybody else what not to do. Mm -hmm. And when you look at what we have designed, we have solar covers for our, our system. We have bathrooms for our systems. We're going to have at least 400 KVW charging for our systems. Everything that we wanted is, you know, Josh and I both having F-150 Lightnings. For everybody that knows, I'm pushing almost 40,000 miles now on my truck, and I've had a little over, what, a year and a quarter, year and a half, year and yeah. a quarter, uh, within the first month it came out. So I have been able to see what I would rather have and what I needed to use. And then it comes down to like your podcast that you kind of educate people on, well, here's what other people have had problems with. Here are the other areas that they're improving. And you let them know that there is a possibility of coming back. That's, you know, that that's that's part of the best thing about Alany, which I think is their European model coming in and then uh, uh, now building the, what was it, Alana, A-N-N-A, I believe. You know, that is 30,000 charging systems that are supposed to be up and running for everybody. Now, that still don't mean anything if the cost is high and it's too expensive to run. So they got to get the cost down and they have to have other means that they can go with. But uh, still, mm -hmm. good things coming, I, I think, ahead. Yeah, I think good things coming. And uh, but yeah, it's it'll be interesting to see. Of course, it's great that we have funding to take advantage of to build out this infrastructure and then also to help people access EVs with tax, you know, incentives like that. And then what happens when it tapers and what kind of strategies will stand when, when it does, because they are, I mean, it's just really expensive infrastructure. It's, and it, it, yeah, it costs a lot to have a lot of energy delivered in a short amount of time, like at DC fast chargers. So how exactly are we going to balance that out to make it cost effective is going to be really interesting to watch because I do think that there are solutions. I'm not exactly sure what they are yet, but we're going to have to find them. Yeah. And I yeah. think that the current amount of federal funding out there is is enough to get a, a baseline infrastructure push in to where you're going to have a lot like all these states that are getting their first round of push to put 50 every 50 miles, these stations, uh, they're still having 70 percent of their bucket of funds remaining for Few more sites and more level twos and developing out the network uh, because those funds have to be pushed towards those type of directives. So I think in a five-year period, when we get to the end of this funding, we're going to have enough of a baseline infrastructure to have an encouragement towards the space. And then obviously these, uh, these uh, manufacturers and these, uh, these uh, companies like us will have enough vehicles charging that we can justify future um, investments into the infrastructure uh, because mm -hmm. it is expensive. But I think both on the charging station front and on the, um, on the vehicle front uh, economy of scale, when you deal with um, basically the, the high expense that EVs are currently um, we've, we've kind of brought this up, you know, you can't lower vehicle prices when you're only producing 5,000 of them, but you know, you can, when you're producing 500,000 of them. And so that's something that as we are progressing in this space and as infrastructure improves, I think that uh, we will see with quantity of stations being produced, there will be some uh, savings when it comes to the actual cost of the physical infrastructure. Uh, but also there will be other solutions that will allow us to have um, more reliable network and to have, you know, kind of a more diverse network. But I think in five years time with all the funding that they're currently pushing through the federal government, uh, all of those things are going to create enough of a network to take us to the next step of EV adoption. Um, I don't think that we're going to see EV sites anywhere near as frequent as gas stations um, anytime soon, but to, to have them every 25 miles would definitely increase my confidence on the road compared to uh, right now where it's, you know, a hundred miles apart and your range, you know, can't justify getting to the next stop. And so you have to stop at this, this location, which is what we currently experience in East Tennessee. 
we just kind of talked about with Chris a little bit. I mean, it's a little bit better in California, obviously, because there's such a major push in California for EVs. But you go out uh, to our region when you come to the Midwest and to, uh, you know, the East, uh, unless you're in the big coastal areas, there's not a diverse network. And Jesse and I have done most of our driving uh, long distance. I mean, a lot of our miles have been long distance road trips. And so we've kind of been strapped to the current network, which is one of the reasons that we, you know, looked at changing that network by creating our own, you know, infrastructure. Um, so that's something that I think that is going to improve over the next five years. Um, but that's something that we still are in the infancy of getting those stations online and then the secondary question comes to, like I was saying with Pilot, uh, they've gotten a lot of these awards um, and they're very expensive. And so you have to have a system somehow that can encourage future adoption, because if EVs to cost as a vehicle, they cost more than gas powered vehicles. And then if the charging costs more than gas does, uh, that's unless you are a true environmentalist that's trying to uh, to do a better thing for the planet, which most people I don't think share that sentiment uh, nationwide. They they care more about the dollars and cents than hey I'm gonna I'm gonna get an EV for j- purely environmental reasons. If you're dealing with high power or high expense vehicles and high expense refueling, it's never going to encourage the future of that industry. So we have to one, I think with the tax incentives, I think we're pretty close on the cost of vehicle, but as economy of scale improves, we'll have better cutbacks and more reasonable pricing, similar to what Tesla's done with their vehicles. But then the charging systems, we can't have 60 cents, 70 cent charging because it's just not sustainable, at least in our area. Maybe in California where power costs 35 cents a kilowatt, you know, that that makes more 35. sense. 35. You wish it was 35. Yeah. I mean, here, like it's 11 <laughs> cents if I plug it in my house. Yeah. So I'll charge at my house all day, every day. And it, it saves me yeah. a ton of money. It's why one of the reasons I bought my truck. Um, but for the average person, if you're going on road trips and it's going to cost you more than gas, that's not that's not a sustainable future for the the economy of, of growing that industry. Now, something that we do that is also switching gears from this conversation is... Hold on, before... I don't want to switch gears too far because... Well, go I ahead. Think, yeah, I think there's... So, I think the only thing I'll, I'll add, though, is is that you're talking about California. I think the calculus, too, is different for different drivers. And I think it's important to recognize that because, um, you know, I've been really passionate about getting this adapter for, for the Tesla, you know, and I, you know, I, I have never... My sample size is low, like 12... DC fast charges in my life, but um, I've never connected to a EV, or not, not EV Go, but uh, Electrify America, and had a successful first attempt. I've either been <laughs> derated, or it didn't connect, or the poor guy with the pull star who got locked into place coming back from um, from F the pumps event with the Cybertruck. Right, I felt like I was there for an hour, hoping this poor family wouldn't get stranded and. Um, so for, you know, for me, and we've got a lot of options, you know, I, I've talked about charging at station. I went down to charge point and tested my adapter at charge point, which is one of the few places you can. Um, but I will pay more as someone who mostly charges at home before. And one of my big things about going down to the Cybertruck event with Will was to test it, to drive my family to Disneyland, for example, with, you know, what two stops do I need to make Harris ranch Bakersfield? What's the charging infrastructure? I'm perfectly happy to go and know my EV and risk it and get down to 3%, but not with my family in the car. Exactly. So I, I will go to a pilot flying J and pay more, or I will go to a Tesla out of network and pay more for the few times that I charge um, before I chase down the 25 cent deal or, or, you know, the, the free, there's a free Caltrans 50 kilowatt one along I five at a couple of spots. But I'm going for reliability. I'm going for what's around it. And I will pay more for that one or two trips a year, which is a different calculus than what you guys are doing, doing 40,000 miles a year. And I think the the trying to transition to that early majority means a lot of people charging at home a lot, hopefully, right? And that's where the value proposition changes because so much of our bubble in the EV space is stuck in this idea of the long road trip or which is fun to nerd out on and great to, to crunch the numbers. But for that early majority, it's really about the, the Francy experience of throwing the dog in the car, doing the trip to dad's house. And, and so I'd love, cause see for your unique situation, you drove out there to pick up the car with Kyle in his Tesla, correct? 
in my stepmom's Tesla. Yes. Stepmom's Tesla. Okay. But then you came back with Jordan. Yes. And, and you have two different charging networks. Tell me about the experience going there and, and how that felt, you know, versus the anxiety of coming back. We use that term anxiety a lot, right? What was that like for you to get comparing? That's a perfect example, right? What is the experience going one way versus coming back? What was that like? Yeah. And you can like watch the whole road trip to back with, uh, you know, me in the VF8 and Jordan in the Model Y performance doing the same 800 miles from North Carolina to Tennessee and seeing that on the out of spec motoring channel. But yeah, so Kyle and I took a Model Y out there and we unfortunately got a flat tire on I-40 because there were crazy potholes after the storm, as y'all might know. But the charging at Tesla, it was, I mean, the car, you know, it navigates there really easily. So that's a great part of it. It preconditions the battery, which is great. You get there, you're at the right temperature, you get the charge, you can do it really quickly. You can do like, the way that Tesla is set up with the network is that it's so more common that where you pull off in some city, there's going to be Tesla chargers. So just the ubiquity of the Tesla supercharger network is a huge game changer. We don't have to plan, you know, can I go 180 miles? You know, like somewhere in that 180 miles, there's going to be a supercharger. So you can stop there, charge up as much as you need to get, but it can be as short as 10 minutes. You don't have to charge up the 30, 40 minutes that we experienced on the way back with the VF8 because we're limited to the CCS charging network, which was really different. So on the way there, I mean, you can shorter charging stops and uh you know you still are like pulling over but you it, kyle is really efficient about it too where he's like we'll just drive to the next one that we need to charge at charge as 15 10 15 minutes get on the road again and re repeat so i would say it's pretty easy not all the locations are super uh packed with amenities i'll say that you know you it, that's also an interesting part that i'm sure y'all have thought about is you know the convenience store gas station model and how we haven't totally adopted that for EV charging, which makes sense because it's different, but also how are we going to take inspiration from it? Because obviously it works. Uh, and then on the way back with the Model Y and Jordan had a, you know, NAX or CCS to NAX, CCS to J3400, I guess, um, adapter. So he was able to charge at CCS stations, whereas I'm not able to charge at supercharger Tesla stations in the VF8. Yeah. So it was, we, he was having to be like, well, I definitely know I have a stop between here and there, but we've got to find my stop for the VF8, the CCS uh, charger. So that was different because we had to collaborate on that a little bit to make sure that we both had the range to get where we needed to go. Luckily, he could charge at any station that I could charge at, but not the other way around. So it was a bit more route planning, I would say. And the the VinFast was not connected to data. There was just a hiccup there. I don't think that should be everyone's experience, but thereby I wasn't able to navigate to stations and perhaps precondition the battery, which it says it can do. I haven't seen that in action but hopefully it can, because if your battery is colder and it was cold mornings, you know, then you're getting definitely a slower charge. And the highest peak charge that I saw on that road trip was 120 kilowatts, but that was for a second. Mostly I saw around a hundred and then it would derate when it got too hot. And Jordan, were those, uh, it, were those 150 uh -huh. kilowatt chargers that you were plugging into. Oh that? yeah. I would, never yeah. would pull up to a 350 kilowatt charger with the VinFast because it cannot at, uh, get anywhere near that. So don't take up that resource, you know, but a lot of people don't even know that. So there's a lot of, uh, I mean, that's another topic too, is, you know, EV driver education, information, charging etiquette, as you were talking about the unplugging and stuff, which I'd love to know y'all's opinion on. Jesse, um, what did we name? We, we decided a name for the etiquette book. What was it? We talked about this last week. Do you remember what the name of the etiquette I, book that we were going to make was? You know, I'm, I made it up then, and I can't remember now. It was something about the power <laughs> book, power up book of proper etiquette. And it we was were going to make a book. We had a clever everybody. name for it last week, but we had an etiquette conversation last week about like how do you coordinate with other drivers at stops, and how do you how do you mm -hmm. bounce around all those things? Because and there's, my there's... idea behind it was doing it like a 19 or an 1880s etiquette book with the proper hand drawn pictures and everything. Love that is, that. And then with the uh, the older uh, less you know British type of speaking, thou shall not go through and. 
parked between somebody else or you have to have a skipping between different charging stations. There's actually a lot of stuff there that people don't realize that if you just jump up and take somebody's spot, you're probably going to have a fight on your hands with some people, especially with Christopher over there. You know, he, he's kind I of am a not a fighter. Man, so, no, no. Um, you can tell when you're a 49ers fan, you got to fight a lot of people <laughs> off. So, um, but uh, yeah. yeah, so we actually looked into an etiquette uh, a book that we want to do. It might be a good collaboration. Keep that in mind that uh, we might release that because uh, that, that would, would be, be kind of a cool thing to put on a website is what is the proper etiquette for Teslas? Because it's different than CCS. What is the proper etiquette for CCS? You know, mm -hmm. what do you need to do in certain situations? Do you share your your adapter if somebody needs your adapter? Do you share your adapter at that point? Is there systems that allow you to get a another adapter back if somebody steals your adapter? And there's a lot of weird things out there that you could probably make a few pages on. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, like how are we going to get the same information to everyone. And then with everyone coming onto the supercharger network and everything. And I was just speaking to this man, Kelly Carmichael, he's in Canada, but he reached out to us because he's been studying uh, electric transportation and microgrids as well, but for many, many, many years, decades. And he was sharing with me, of course, if you were an early adopter with a leaf and we'll have a whole podcast with him, but if you, you know, back in 2011, 2014, it was a different time. It was way Absolutely. more communal. Like, I'll let you charge at my house. This is where you can charge. There were like 10 of you in, in the city or whatever. But now he's he likened it to game theory, whereas the number of EVs and EV drivers on the road has grown. And now there's competition for this resource that is EV charging and how it creates a more individualistic attitude in yep. people where, yeah, they'll get in a fight at a charger. And it's like, oh my God, it went from being like, yeah, we're a part of this thing, go Leafs, uh, to no, I'm going to beat you out for this. It went because... from Oregon Trail to Sim City really quick. You know? <laughs> oh, it sure did. It's, it's, and, yeah, that's and I think it's interesting. I think it's easy there too in the social media world um, to think it's more prevalent than it is though, because uh, although shout out to my sister who is absolutely, if you've ever seen that family guy meme where it's got the, you think you're better than us, right? She's that person. She, she has an S and an X owner. Um, when the three became so prevalent, she's like, I'm with commoners now. And it's a lot of what, <laughs> right. A lot of what you talked about because they would go to Tesla stations and suddenly there's trash on the ground that never used to happen. And mm -hmm. You know, they used Tesla owners used to clean up and care for it and they wouldn't leave, you know, dogs stuff in the around the corner. And yeah, it, there's they've lost a lot of that communal place, but still I know from the Tesla groups that I hang out with and um and and from the stuff I do with a, a group out here uh, called Ectera, who does EV community stuff. You know, we had sustainable house where there's a guy that still has a, a charger. Um, slow AC charger right in front of his house, invites anybody to plug in for free. His house runs on solar. It's it's out there. And then, you know, on my drive to and from Southern California, one, you guys are just better humans than me because I sought out the 350 with my F-150 that has no hope of using 350. But it's it's but because ours, of, ours, ours can peak over 150. Peak. So getting a 350, you will get better performance than For that 10 minutes. Right, yeah. right. But but that's I will all last anyway. That's that's what I found with you, Francie, is, is the same thing that if I plugged into 150, I'm getting 98 or you know if i'm lucky 105 the 150 is never giving me 150 so you know when i went to harris ranch for example i went i plugged into a 350 of course the first one didn't work because it never does and then you know I, I moved but um versus though on my way back when i went to the walmart it was packed the walmart was packed the poor guy with the pole star stuck you know another one is not communicating it was calling me one and it thought i was on an e you know in, in a and a Kia EV9 or not EV9, um, whatever that that was that he thought I was in. But the whole thing was a mess. Another one's giving me a red ring of death that I can't charge on. So, the, no, there I'm going for the 150 out of respect. Um, it, and as far as the unplugging thing, though, again, I'm if you're charged, if you're at 100% and it's just sitting there, I might give you a five-minute window. And if you're still in the Walmart at that point, then I'm, I'm cutting your tires. <laughs> I'm not cutting your tires, but I'm unplugging you. I'm unplugging you. And, and, you know, um, and, and for, at least with AC charging, it used to be that you would, 
you would actually just leave your charge port unlocked like at your workplace. My sister works at Intel and this is a common practice and at FedEx too, it's a common practice that if you're in that EV community, you, you learn that etiquette of you leave your charge port door open and then the person goes over and moves the plug over for you. So I, I, I don't believe that unplugging is is an evil i would, wouldn't stand there waiting for it to hit zero and you know or 100 and do it and i think maybe michelin you know you heard of michelin restaurants that started with michelin having a michelin guide to, to the road trips that needs to come back like michelin needs to come and sponsor out of spec Ooh, and there you go. get you guys involved to do a whole you could have affiliate out of spec people around the country to submit it, it kind of like the uh not the a bad rate idea your, yeah, instead well, of rate your charge, instead of rate your charge, you have the, the Michelin guide to EVs and you re redo that because that's where that driving culture started. That's where it needs to come. Uh, I, I th- And we have examples on what five star would be in a situation like yeah. that. Electrify mm-hmm. America just opened up a fully indoor charging station. Right up here, Bay Area. Right yeah. San Fran- so, I wish it wasn't in San Francisco, although that's yeah. probably a good thing that it's indoors being in San Francisco. Are but you yeah. going to go mm-hmm. get us a video uh, of you using it? Uh, I've been, yeah, I need to get up there. I just, I hate going to the city with such a passion, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you gotta it's, do it. it. I know it's I got to take one, take one for the team and get in there. And I've seen a couple of pictures and I was like, oh, cool. You went and visited. No, I don't have to, but no, I, I, I should go up there and it's indoors and it's got a lounge. It's got vending machines. It's, it's got all that kind of well, when stuff. When you're in San Francisco, you need to be indoors when you're charging to, uh, yeah, I mean, to survive, just in so. case. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and it goes back to what you're talking about, you know, the etiquette aspect of it again. What is the etiquette for level two stations? Do you unplug? Do you go ahead and plug up your neighbor's vehicle in a situation with a level two? I think so. The automatic? I think so. Mm-hmm. Is that something that we need to have it to where not everybody knows that if you leave your door open, somebody will do that for you? So there's a lot of etiquette like that. There's going to be a ton of level twos getting built in the next three years now that there's hundreds of of millions of dollars that's going to be flowing into that industry now that all the corridor fields are going to be done. And then when you start talking about how people feel about this, you know, we, Josh and I, are very passionate about what we're doing here. And we were fortunate that we received more funding in the state of Tennessee than any other company to build EV charging stations. We are the top of that. We may even get more depending on how it works out. When you do that, we have to make sure that there is no red ring of death. We have to make sure that if our, one of our four stations is not working correctly, we have to have people there immediately to fix it because we are setting the standard not only for for our stations, but for everybody because we did provide every single thing the state asked for and we were the only company. If you want to ride a scooter from our charging station two miles down to the middle of the downtown, we have scooters you can rent by just taking an app and clicking on it. That is the type of system that we have. You can use the bathroom there. It is going to be a warm bathroom in the middle of wintertime. You are going to have a cover. These are little things, like you said, in the in the gas station industry and in the in that service industry, you know, we really don't have that. But at the same time, I come from a telecommunications background as well. And I see these as problems that we can fix with technology. I see that you have Amazon stations that you can walk into a kitchen-like area, order your food, and there is your ability to get everything from a seaside that you can actually order anyway. And I've been into restaurants and and gas stations now um, that have that type of system. You still have people there, but you go through and you buy your own food. You click it out as you go. There's not a lot of... uh, you know, there's a lot of ability there that I think that as technology helps, we can really create a touchless system that has power production on the back end of it to where none of the power comes from the grid. It's a low price and we're charging everybody around 40 cents or 35 cents per KWH. Our goal is to be in the 20 cent range and mm-hmm. uh, and make a profit. I don't know if we can do that, but that is our goal eventually. That is really interesting to hear about your model. And I, I'll encourage you all to listen to the podcast that I have with Kelly, because we did discuss the per minute per kilowatt hour pricing. And of course, it changes like if it's level two in your apartment garage, but then also how 
he he believes from his research that a dynamic pricing with a bit of both would be best in terms of profitability for the station. So I I, I don't want to try to summarize what he said because I would do it wrong. He's the expert, <laughs> but that's why I have experts on the podcast and I don't try to explain everything. But I think that's really interesting. And of course, yeah, all the amenities that you're mentioning, I think are really important to get people to I mean, you have to spend some time at these stations. Sometimes you have to like go looking for like a restroom and like go into a nearby hotel. It's like not ideal. Am I supposed yeah. to sneak into this hotel? But then I also think, uh, you know, since it's, you know, I'm a woman's perspective as well, safety, I think that hasn't always been the focus. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, some sites are inherently less safe because they're at a shopping center, but I have to hit that at night because if I'm going on a road trip up to Ohio and it, there's was no lighting. So I, I'd just love to hear a little bit about how y'all are considering that too, in terms of, I think, especially lighting. I think that makes a huge difference if Absolutely. things are lit up in a parking lot. And of course, we can go inside someplace. Yeah. J Jesse's we message to me last night lights. was that we wanted to be lit up like a Christmas tree. So, uh, I mean, yeah. it's a freestanding charging site, but I mean, because of the fact that we're not doing it in an existing parking lot, all of our sites are completely independent dirt. And so we're going to be building it from the ground up. And It'll it have restrooms. Fun, you know. We should when make you, it a beacon. Josh make it a beacon a great, of LED lights. Well, Josh made a great uh, in the very beginning of this. He made a great idea. It was, hey, when we plug in or when somebody plugs in, we need to have lights coming from the top down, different colors to kind of make it. I look want like, like a little like experience. So the charger showing that you know, it's activated, nice. like the front yeah. of the Rivian. Like the front of the Rivian is yeah, one of yeah. my favorite exactly. things. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So anything that creates an experience, because people yeah. that have an experience will want to experience that more later. And then we're looking at cost, and that is an experience. If I can make it cheaper, that is something. Yeah, Josh. I said I I, uh, I can't tell you the amount of times that we've been uh, pulling up at six o'clock in the morning to a Sam's Club parking lot uh, to to charge, <laughs> and Sam's is closed, open not uh, open. Yeah. yeah. So, oh, you're on a, a road trip. We need to use the restroom. So I'm over here on my phone, like um, walking into the hotel. Hey guys, blah, blah, blah. And then like trying to sneak over to the bathroom and not <laughs> make it look that like we're, we're people of that hotel. It's like, oh yeah, my key card won't work. I'll be right back. Let me use your bathroom before I talk uh -huh. to you. And then exactly. I'm exactly. But that's, that's the experience. So, I mean, like one of the reasons we developed our model was I want to be able to pull up to a charging stop and grab a snack that you're right. There's no justification for a full service station like a gas station because there's not enough traffic in most of these areas. But a vending machine, I'd be I'd be happy with being able to grab a Coke from a vending machine and grab a, a oh, candy yeah. bar. Terrific. A clean restroom. Yeah, clean That's restroom. If Lights. I can have a clean restroom, if I can have it well lit, if I can have it covered, if I can have a pull through charger for my trailer with my truck, and then I can have the ability to grab a Coke while I'm sitting there. That's the start. Oh, and, then, and a free level two charger for Justice 40 yeah. in case somebody can't afford, they can plug up and wait. Yeah, it's a long wait, but it's free. So they yeah. can charge on a on a trickle. And I'm going to have a, a walking path for you and your dog to be able yeah. to go out. And there will be a small walking area along the outside of it. So nice. all of the trash cans we added. Trash cans yes. and squeegees. Tra yes. Trash cans and squeegees. Two things that... People for uh, Tesla sites are just don't have them. Don't have trash yeah. cans. Don't have squeegees. Those no. are two. And that's one why of you see things. banana pills slapped up on the side of an electrify America station. So. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> if they make a disposable but keepable free squeegee that we can like hand out that you, know, you break Beep. the end of it and it automatically and then you keep it in your vehicle. All right, that yes. way, people. I'm gonna you're have getting to all you're getting all exuberant. You're getting all fancy. Ideas. We're, we're gonna go. We're gonna go invent free that one. Yeah. Squeegee. And, just so you were talking about your power and how, yeah. Can you explain where your power is coming from? So when we stations? start, the station will be connected to the grid to start with, but actually something that we've done, which is unique to any other provider um, is all of our sites actually came with land acquisition. And so we actually have five plus acres at every single site. Um, and so our vision for this is to target rural America with these type of stations, and we can put clean energy generation uh, on site. Our solar cover is enough to charge two vehicles um, just every day, even on the on the slow days and four vehicles on the busy days, uh, or sorry, in the summer days when it's uh, you know more 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 sun time. But that's something that, you know, we have to figure out a way to get that energy into the vehicles, whether that's just offsetting power bills and then using the grid. But if you get a full scale solar farm with a small battery, it can output 
enough energy uh at enough at enough speed to actually charge the vehicles so our Mm -hmm. vision from the get-go was energy independent charging sites because rural america doesn't have a strong grid and you four vehicles plugged up to some of these stations would consume more power than the whole town would um so that's where our 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 goal from the get-go was land acquisition or have future land acquisition that you can put the clean energy generation via solar or hydrogen generators um, and then have the ability to use that to power the vehicles. Um, obviously, that makes it incredibly. 20, yeah. To how, how many acres did we end up with? 20 for four sites. Um, so yeah. it was pretty much exactly five, nice. five a site. But that gives you the ability to generate um, good energy on the site and utilize it for. And basically, we're going to open the site. We're going to let it run for a few months and monitor demand. Some of these sites, we don't anticipate having 10 cars a day. We're thinking maybe three, four, five a day. And so we can go in and figure out what that demand is and then go and backfill. So whether that is a a quarter megawatt farm, a half megawatt farm, a megawatt farm, supply the energy generation on that site that's needed to make it energy independent. And then from there, be able to go out. And uh, and that way, when you generate your own energy, you don't have to pay the high cents per kilowatt that you're going to be billed. And obviously, yeah, that's and- not a functional model for the middle of town, but the middle of town also has a stable grid uh, with a lot more vehicles yeah. to justify profit. In rural America, you're not seeing a ton of traffic. So you have to figure out creative ways to make these things uh, at least break even until vehicle confidence and and consumers, you know, increase on the roads to justify those, those expenses. And we are basing this on 22 cents per KWH is our cost of power. And we feel like six cents, seven Mm -hmm. cents would pay for the advancements we need to have the infrastructure and then pay for that infrastructure over X amount of year period for our ROI. So as long as we're paying 22 cents, we financially can even put it in without the incentives. Now, our goal would be to get incentives. But on this first round of of uh, incentives, we weren't able to do that. It has to be used on site, and it was a competitive bid. Or we would have loved to added a lot of solar and some other things to it. Um, it just wasn't financially feasible for us at at that particular time. Now we're also looking at some of our locations being hydrogen storage and distribution centers as well. As that market develops, I know there's some problems in California. As that's recently, Shell announced that they're pulling some of that. But it's because, yeah, but it's because they don't have the uh, material coming in. They don't, nobody's making enough hydrogen to support them. So we are actually looking at that in Tennessee as well to produce it. And then the business model for us there is if we have it on site and we're storing that hydrogen, there's nothing saying we don't convert that over. If it's been produced by green hydrogen, which is by solar, there's nothing saying we don't convert that over for electrical power that is designed for the people that are using the station. And that's an instantaneous power that we can use instantly and convert that system over with water as our discharge unit. So now we even have another reason to have that distribution center at the at the site. So we have several things that we're working on with that. It also supports EV aircraft because they have a hydrogen aircraft system now that's coming in. Same with the trucking industry with hydrogen. So there's a lot of similarities that we're utilizing to kind of create a model that puts all of them together. Wow, super cool. I, I really like it. And and I think thinking about it full circle too is something that I'm really interested in the EV space, whether it's from the life cycle of the EV, but how everything can work together back to ecology uh, exactly. at, at a site like that and really build it in, which is just a way to be more efficient as well and creative problem solving. And look, we have this sort of output. How can we make that an input somewhere else? Mm-hmm. That's really cool. I can't wait to visit one of your sites one day. And it's job creation too. You even mentioned mm-hmm. that we are going to have more people needing to support these systems. And all we mm-hmm. see is, well, that's job creation for rural parts of the state of Tennessee. We don't even get into the data side because Josh and Christopher were there and rolled their eyes at me because of our data <laughs> system that we were wanting to include. So I'm not going to mention it, but uh, uh, yeah, so we're definitely working with all three of them and trying to get a holistic design that can support all three types of systems at the same time. I love harmonizing all that stuff, right? It's anytime you can do that, it's it's going to make a, a much more robust system and make it more widespread. And there's a lot of use cases for that. And I think it's it's interesting your background in STEM and, and ecology and all of that stuff. And, and you're, now you're, ed, you're out in Tennessee now, but your education 
was all in Colorado. Is that right? And that's right. Uh, so how to like explain that whole origin story of Francie getting to Tennessee and out of spec is in Colorado. Is that a coincidence or how did that whole thing come to be that, you know, you're educating in Colorado, you're now in Tennessee. Walk us through that, the origin story of, of Francie. Yeah. Born and raised in the South and the Delta. And then uh, I've always been a bit of an adventurous spirit. So I actually have roots in my on my mother's side back in Colorado, uh, in the in the mountains of Colorado, Buford, Colorado. And we've been going out west, specifically to Wyoming, since I was uh, a young lassie. So I've been experienced with the West a little bit. So when I started thinking about school and applying to school, I toured out, it was just either Tennessee or Colorado, really. That's all I knew. So, um, and I barely knew Colorado. So I just ended up really falling in love with Colorado, getting scholarships, getting the opportunity to go out to school there. And then I lived there for 10 years, just just up until uh, September. So I joined out of spec and, and moved back home to just to be close to family while I can work from wherever. Uh, but Colorado was wonderful. The education that I got at the University of Colorado Boulder in the biology department was, I mean, some of the best time of time of my life. I mean, the most amazing people there that cherish not only teaching science, but the art of teaching. And I think that that's incredible. And then I stayed and lived and worked and played. And then I went to more school up at Colorado State, stayed and worked and played. So I went from the natural science and STEM and then how to bring that into business. So that's what I studied. And then I, EVGO is a, you know, after I did my consulting and stuff, I was like, let's join a bigger team. Right. And so EVGO was what I joined. And I was at an event in San Diego on a work assignment at the fully charged event, actually, uh, meeting with an automaker partner. And my boss had sent me one of Kyle's videos and was like, by the way, this is Kyle. And uh, this is out find, of spec. Find this guy. This guy's going to be there. Find him. Well, yeah. So that was like months before or like a month or two or three before. And he was like, also, like he, you know, ch checks in on the charging infrastructure and he uh, is in Colorado, I think. And so I I think I looked at Kyle's LinkedIn and I was like, Fort, Fort Collins, that's where I live. So I was like, okay, this guy's in my town. Interesting. Whatever. Out of sight, out of mind. I go to San Diego and um, I'm at this event and I see Kyle walking around, but I honestly didn't remember his name or the EV or the channel. So I was like, I just know this guy lives in Fort Collins. So I was like, well, might as well make the connect, you know? And so I trotted up behind him and uh, what turns out to be his friend Drew from uh, Martian we Wheels. And I was like, hey, don't you live in Colorado? And that's how we became friends and just like kind of EV people. So we hung out in Colorado. He had, you know, some EVs on loan. So I got to try like the launch and the plaid and then see the, see the Lucid Air and stuff. So that's, we became connected, but it wasn't until you know, over a year later that it was, I was ready to make a change. And he was like, I have this project that I think you would be a great fit for. So that's how I got wrapped up in this whole scenario. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is awesome. And, and then, so then walk us through like a, a, a week in the life because your, your podcasts are, are unique in that, you know, like I, I noticed a pattern that a lot of people, um, the traditional podcasts like to release on Fridays. And there's there's a big one that releases on Saturday as well. And I'm like, man, I and originally our podcast was released on a Friday. I'm like, man, it's just another podcast on a Friday. Let's switch it up to a midweek. Um, but what's unique about your channel? And we know how hard it is for us to coordinate our schedule and get together what the time zone differences and different things. And and then, but you guys put out content. There was one this morning, there was one over the weekend. It is it is a real like professional content creative you know, with all the different out of spec studios arms out there, what's that look like? How does that planning, is it sometimes you just get a text or a phone call? Like, Hey, can we put this together? Is it planned? Is it storyboarded? Like, what's that look like? That's a really great question because yeah, it's a daily podcast sometimes twice a day if there's breaking news. So like I said in the beginning, everything EV and EV adjacent. So I'll plan ahead and I will get expert interviews uh, or interviews with people living with EVs or or like maybe not exactly an expert, but someone who is really well versed in Tesla uh, full self-driving or in Rivian software updates or in something else. So those things I'll plan ahead, do my research, but sometimes it's breaking news. So just got to uh, do quick research and then get on the horn and record the news about it. And 
you know, of course we can have like a lot of opinions, but also what I do is like educational stuff where it's like, this is the battery battery technologies that exist. Um, this is a state that's using battery energy storage to power their whole grid, you know, stuff like that. So it does take a lot of work behind the scenes. Like I said, I feel like I'm back in university because if I'm going to at all speak to this stuff, I have to, you know, know something about it. And I don't know everything, but I've always been a bit of a jack of all trades, I guess. So I do, there's, there's hours of research. Uh, Ryan on the team helps me do the research because there's tons to research and we're, we're looking at what's breaking, but we're also looking at what is interesting to us and what is relevant in this space. So, you know, we have our research idea and then I go through and I think of how the story will flow best. And I'd say, you know, it, it takes a good few hours and it's kind of a sporadic schedule sometimes, which is nice because I can make my own schedule. But sometimes, like I said, news breaks. So Kyle and I will jump on or me and whoever knows about it will jump on and try to cover it as quickly as possible to make sure the information that exists is available to everyone. So try to keep the content diverse, but, you know, EV headlines, breaking news, all the way to like deep dives into stuff that I think is cool as well. So I appreciate you highlighting that. It's a good bit of work and uh, it's fun too. It's impressive to watch. And then, you know, you've, you've got famously, you guys are just, you nerd into the most minutia of things, which is fun to watch. I mean, I'll watch, I'll watch a lot of videos on my TV because it's just, there's so much, it is like marathoning, uh, you know, a show sometimes to, to get, the, <laughs> there's so much content, right. That you just want to see yeah. it on a, on a big screen. Agreed. So, are, are you are you a data nerd yourself or are you like a compliment to that or does it like how uh how does that resonate with you are you like man i love to dig into the minutia or is it more like i don't and i love seeing it because that's not an attribute i necessarily have that's a good question because i did do a lot of research in the past you know i studied biology and that's a science. And so there was a lot of small data points that would come together to paint the big, big picture, but I've also t taken the personality tests and stuff and observed myself. I think I'm a, where my strong suit is, is explaining the big picture and getting to the minutia. If I, if that's, you know, either who I'm speaking to or the right audience, or it makes sense to go there, but I really, you know, have a background in academia as well. I love teaching. And so being able to get an idea from my brain and my mouth to someone else's so that it makes sense to them is my goal. So I think the conceptual uh, kind of abstract, but not too abstract, but artistic way of getting that to someone is what I love to do. But the data is what makes it all work. There are people on our team, though, that are far more and people that I've worked with in my life that just love the numbers and love the Excel sheets. And I'm like, that is so great that you love that. And I'm going to let you run with that. Yeah, that's and Jesse. if you need support, let me know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like some people's brains just work better that way. So I think obviously finding where you can bring value to a team is great. I'm not, you know, illiterate in the Excel sheets, but it's not my passion as much as let's understand the details, how it works together as it does in science, and then be able to explain how this is, why this matters. What's the big picture here and seeing what kind of opinions we can all form on them. So that's kind of how my brain works. There are definitely the nerdy, folks on the team we're all kind of nerds i mean if you look at it right you know new technology how's it emerging but that's what i see as well as like transportation is a huge part of the human experience as is technology we're seeing both change in a very you know short time span and there's so many challenges and uh, a lot of different facets that are playing in from government to everyday people and so how how is that all working together so that's what i'm really fascinated about as well of course that was, you know, energy too yeah and that was really the reason that we started turn down for what was you know we saw the opportunity to take you know real people's lives and real people's experiences and the original uh pilot episodes were heavily focused around the ev the average ev driver what is what are the real time pros and cons because a yeah. lot of times you see and you get onto these uh you're listening to these podcasts or these uh reports and everything's pie in the sky and you know it's it, it's important to be realistic of if you do this this is what you have to expect this this model of vehicle this is the range this is what to expect this is the pros this is the cons 
uh, because you know the average the, the best way to to educate people uh, in general is to listen to people's real life experiences and and listening to what they are. So whether that's bringing on an expert that knows more about things to help explain things to other people, or interviewing actual drivers with real life, like we did with uh, we did that with Ben Westby a couple weeks ago. I mean, he uses his lightning to power his house because he does not have the grid at his house, which is just insane. Yeah. But like. For his practical use, an EV is exactly what he needs. Uh, but th whether it's that use case or it's just, hey, I, I, I lose power at my house and now I have an opportunity to have a, have a backup or I save X amount of dollars or I don't like this. I had to go back to a hybrid because there was X, Y, Z issues with my experience. Uh, there, There is such a conversation to have around that is the reason that I, you know, kind of launched the the vision of of having a podcast that we can have that discussion. But um, obviously the research and development and some of the cool people and things you get to talk to, like you're saying, it is an education for us, uh, but also for uh, the people that get the opportunity to listen to uh, both of our podcasts. So now, most importantly, though, being alumni with Colorado, who is better, Ralphie, the Buffalo or Chip? This is hard uh, because my, my parents actually <laughs> met in Colorado as well. So it's, you know, I, I feel like Ralphie just holds a spot in my heart. There we go. Unlike okay. the Rams, you know, I mean, I, those are my young college years and then grad school, you're like a little less attached to all of that. So I, I love the Rams too. And Fort Collins is amazing, but I think yeah. I'm a, I think I'm a buff. I'm a buff at heart. Got to keep Ralphie. All right, that's good. Speaks to your, <laughs> speaks to your soul. It, <laughs> yeah. Now, but you're I, around a whole bunch of vehicles. If you could pick any of them that you could take right now, if you could go out and buy, here, here's a million dollars. I know the answer the to this. Do you what think do you, you got? know the answer? What I do, do think I know. I'm going to let you guess. What is it? I think because, and this is, uh, and this is how I knew that, that you were uh, someone that I would resonate with. You're, it, you and I have the same secret love and passion for the ID buzz. And I think that would be, uh, and I, I'm telling you if it, my top three were, were cyber truck and lightning and ID buzz. And, and I was like, whichever <laughs> comes first. And I know that they are so different, but the ID buzz to me, cause I came from a Honda Odyssey minivan. And so that was like, oh yeah. I saw, and there is shout out to Roaming Norway, who as I have followed him in his ID Buzz stuff, just so jealously. I'm like, when is this coming? Please get this here. Like, take my money. And I know that you that's going to. You saw I, it last I, night, didn't you? Did you see I've the seen commercial, it. the Super Bowl commercial last night? They had yes. the ID Buzz and the had in the Chattanooga container. in the background. No, and then I they that. showed the ID Buzz at the very end. It was like the history of BMW. And then it ended with like the doors opening and there was like an ID buzz coming out of the container or whatever it was. Yeah. Volkswagen would even be Volks better because BMW really don't know. I said anything. BMW. What am I talking about? Volkswagen. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But you, that's, Francie, you were in Chicago. My dream car. Yeah. You tell me, you've seen it in the, you were at the, just at the Chicago auto show. Yeah. Tell and me about this. Let's share a moment of the ID buzz. They, they had the old uh, 67 bus to like its window. predecessor. Yeah. 21 window. And it's, I mean, that's gorgeous. And and of course, the ID Buzz that they had is like total prototype, just to show one. But I'm so excited for those to come to the U.S. I don't know how I'm going to figure out how to like, you know, afford one and buy one, but I'm going to figure it out because yeah. there is just something I'm, I'm a restless soul. I love to travel. I love to meet new people and travel new places. And, you know, the van life kind of thing, I'm like, Meh, you know, I could trick out like an Astro van, but I don't think that's really it. But the VW lifestyle is just like, I mean, one, it's so cute, but also I think it's so functional. There's so much space. It's great. You could camp in it if you want, but you could just drive it around. It's not about the efficiency. It's about the lifestyle. So I think, I think a, it would be a dream to drive it around like all I think there's a good use case for out of spec to put you in one, uh, just, just to Thank do you, the Josh. real life testing out of spec leadership. If you're listening to this, Kyle, whatever. Get her you're, an ID buzz when it comes out. She well, needs it's, it. It's, this is practical. Thank you. You're doing, you're doing your penance like, with the VIN fast. Uh, Yes. Yeah, I'm paying my dues. And yeah. then, then you can upgrade. Now, and speaking of the Chicago Auto Show, did year. you see the IQ at the Auto Show? We did see the uh, the IQ, and we're going to have a podcast on that. It was no touch, no touch oh, or really? interact. So, that's, but we get, did Josh's, get to see 
Yeah, Josh's project. Is that your is, dream? It's his dream. Well, no, I mean, my, my wife really desperately want, wants one, but uh, I see why. Mm-hmm. But biting, biting a one hundred and sixty thousand dollar SUV is an interesting one, but yeah. it's beautiful. It's a very beautiful vehicle. Very beautiful. We were. It was like the executive trim, which is you know for driving around executives, etc. But it looks really nice, and um, they're they said they're going to be producing it by you know fall or something. Or that's what they say, but year. they haven't even opened up reservations yet. So I, and they I'm wouldn't even let you get into it, huh? You couldn't see it, you couldn't open it, you couldn't sit we, in it. They they had the doors open, and I didn't know that we couldn't touch it. So I was like looking in, and he was like, "Please don't touch." Um, so no, no touch, <laughs> but it is like you know, hand. That one was hand built, so who knows, mm-hmm. you know? But it's something. But yeah, you know, we're we're eager to cover cars when they're available to people because that's what people are going to actually get. But it, it, right. Kyle seemed to think that like, yeah, this is a good sign that it's coming along. So hopefully you get to have your dream too, Josh. If I get my VW ID buzz, we got to get you an Escalade. We'll have to rally idea. up and take the ID buzz next to the Escalade, next to the Lightning and, I mean, and, and yeah. have a photo. Dream yeah. come true. <laughs> Car and Driver is reporting that potentially at the end of this year, the ID will be available. That's what I've heard. So there you go. And That's the reason are, to look forward to like 2025. Mutually, it looks like mutual timelines. It seems like a lot of, we talked about this on the podcast before, it seems like 25 is the year of the EV with a lot yeah. of these new models coming online. 24 is going to be a dead year. And then next year, we're going to see a lot of excitement, I think, with new uh, vehicles. Nax. And, space. and new, hopefully, yeah, yeah Nax. Yeah. I wonder Innovation. if this be made in uh, Chattanooga. Um, I think there... Oh, I can't remember if I got an answer on that, so I won't speak to it. I, I know that something was being shipped over, but it would be cool if they were made in Ch- Chattanooga, of course. Well, I know some of the parts in Chattanooga are going over to South Carolina. South Carolina won the contracts for the new International Scout, which is also owned yeah. by Volkswagen now. So yeah. there's and a lot cool. of comp- that. That's a cool yeah, vehicle. I love, too. I love that vehicle too. I'm hoping yeah. that Ford electrifies their Bronco. That probably be what trades me out of my Tesla. If they have a Bronco coming up, I'll probably. That's yeah. my wife's dream that. vehicle. Yeah. When yeah. I was at the Chicago Auto Show, that was the first thing I did. Is I walked up and I said, "Hey." You need to electrify this Bronco. My, my wife's keeps the Bronco Sport, but I think that would be a great platform for like the Maverick, the Bronco Sport. The totally you sell those things worldwide. My I wife canceled my Bronco in order to get the Lightning. So yeah, I really would like to have a Bronco, but uh, we'll. And we'll I think that's going to be Ford's. Ford's niche needs to be that. It needs to be that thing that. Um, and I I really do equate it a lot like the ID Buzz. It needs to speak to you in some way. There, there needs to go. be something that it reflects the driver. It's got that personality. I think there's a place. I always tell people, man, Ford isn't isn't and shouldn't be trying to be Tesla. They they are different things, and I I think there is a place for all these companies. And my big thing is that I want to have this robust competition available because when BYD lands and they will. They are going to crush us if we don't, you know, they're going to be producing out of Mexico. We need to have these companies producing in Tennessee and South Carolina and Kentucky. And we need this vertical integration. We need these people learning from each other. This is, this is a community thing for me. This is very much, I I will never buy a Y or a three. And it's not because uh, that I hate Tesla. I love Tesla, Um, but those cars do not speak to me. They don't inspire me. They don't fit me. And I love the, uh, I would much rather go to my garage and have an ID buzz, a lightning and a Bronco. That would be fun. What do I want today? Or to me, like a Miata version, right? For, for the kind of fun stuff that for the weekend stuff that, you know, Kyle or, or Zach, right. That that has his model three and does the Canyon drives down there. I want that, right. I want, I want cars that inspire me and speak to me and, and, I, I I think that's what's missing is the fun. And so I can. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, that's what I like about that's... the Cybertruck. The Cybertruck is ugly because it's <laughs> ugly. I like it. It doesn't look like every other truck out there. It's different. It's a different thing that is in this particular time and space. I do not know if it's going to be the best. If I build a vehicle from scratch, would it look like that? No. So it really doesn't appeal to me that way. But because it's not like everything else, I like it. Just like with the Volkswagen bus here, it is different than everything else. That's why people, I think, would like it. Plus, it it has some romanticism back to the yeah. the heritage of what those yeah. vehicles were designed for. Um, you know, we are going to see one that's going to have a wrap on it that looks like the Scooby van. We are going to see a wrap on <laughs> one with flowers and, and and peace symbols. You know, How because much fun it is has that? a heritage like that. 
you can't do that with my F-150 Lightning and people know <laughs> what it really is. So yeah. having that ability to customize it, to go back to a, a, a nostalgia from the time before is what you're talking about. And I can do that with the Bronco. I would have the white center body, the red top and the blue stripes, just like the racing versions when Steve McQueen and all them were going through the desert and things like that. I can't do that in a, in a because I, I'm now over to electric and I'm going to stay that way. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a very good time we're in. I, I hate that the industry is taking it on the chin right now. I think some of that is not necessarily people not buying them, but people being afraid to buy them because you have distance and range anxiety still out there until this money comes in to build these uh, of these stations and it's still going to be the end of the year before we have ours close to being built so you have another 12 months or so before you have our four stations but for tennessee that represents 32 brand new charging stations across the state are going to be built out of this that means that our entire state you're going to be able to go every 20 or 30 miles and have a four unit level three charging station no matter who you are um that is great for the industry if we had that a year ago we would probably have a lot more vehicles sold in tennessee i think the fleets are all going to go to this and if the fleets are going to it that means there's money being produced that ford can then use to develop better and cheaper and profitable vehicles so i'm, I'm excited about it as you can tell so um, a lot to be excited about yeah it's really cool to hear i mean of course, come and speak to y'all, but hear about what you're doing too. And yeah, keep it up. Wish you all the best and can't wait to continue to stay up to date with what y'all are doing and see some of your sites in the future. Well, well we're running long. So I will thank you so much for your time. Uh, we will have you back on anytime that you want to uh, join us. Um, definitely a pleasure to have you. A uh, good conversation today. Um, and we look forward to uh, more more conversations to come. Great thank talk. you so much for having me. Yeah, thank, you, thank you. Well, tune in next week. We'll have another fun episode. But for, for now, peace out, everybody. Bye-bye.